Hey everybody, welcome back to our series on vertex operator algebras. Today's lecture is a short technical note, mostly aimed to help with the bookkeeping of all those algebraic structures we've been playing with so far. In an attempt to make things somewhat less dry, I'm going to motivate this discussion with some short discussions of the physics in which it was originally developed, namely quantum field theory. But first things first, a little review is probably in order. We've been discussing the affine Lie algebra associated to SL2F for some field F, twisted by the action of the involution sigma1. The defining representation of SL2 was given in terms of the Chevalier basis of physicists' sigma matrices, sigma, sigma plus, and sigma minus. These satisfy the commutation relations that by now I hope you're familiar with. The involution sigma1 acts by conjugation on matrices, which sends our central representative sigma to minus itself, and flips the signs of the roots, sigma plus or minus. The one-dimensional linear space H, whose role can be extended to a finite-dimensional central subspace with minimal extra effort, is odd under this involution. The affine algebra then has operators, which we represent as sigma of R, meaning sigma times the formal variable t to the rth power, where r is an integer shifted by one half. The twisting on the field then sends both sigma and t to the one half to minus themselves, leaving combinations like sigma of r invariant, which defines, of course, our twisted affine algebra. We can also re-express these as formal series in the other formal variable z, given as a formal sum over all possible r of sigma of r with z to the minus r. In particular, while sigma as a member of the plain old SL2F commutes with itself, the operators sigma of r and sigma of s do not. Rather, they satisfy their own relationship given by the Lie bracket, which is proportional to the central extension c only when r plus s is equal to zero. Note for the representations that we will be considering, C will act on the relevant modules as the identity operator. Given this sort of Heisenberg algebra behavior, it's useful to split sigma of Z into its positive and negative components. To that end, let's define a sigma of Z plus or minus as the sum over positive or negative values of R, with R and the integers shifted by one half, of course. Hence, we know that all sigma plus commute and all sigma minus commute, but sigma plus with sigma minus does not commute. Products of operators, especially ones defined as sums or even infinite sums, can be confusing things to define. Perhaps you recall all the details involved with summability and the existence of products of formal series that we studied in section 30. In quantum field theory, formal series like sigma of z have a physical meaning. It represents the presence of a particle, where the formal variable z actually parameterizes a coordinate in spacetime, that is, a time and a place. A priori, products of operators here have no real inherent physical meaning, but when they are projected against the Heisenberg module vacuum, they do. The complex number represented by the inner product of sigmas acting on the vacuum at different points can be interpreted as parameterizing the probability of a particle going from the point, say, w to the point z, or at least the actual probability, suitably normalized of course, is given by the modulus square of that quantity. But even that idea is fraught with complication, you still have to check that such products of operators make physical sense. Is it even possible that a particle can go from w to z? Is it going forwards in time and not backwards in time? You know, and so on. Indeed, the issue of operator ordering has important implications for the modeling of the flow of time. Formally, w and z may or may not be orderable, but in physics, time order certainly matters. This ordering is often expressed as a choice of boundary conditions for the solutions to second order differential equations. Now, these considerations seem trivial for the product of, say, two operators, but what happens when you have to compute something with a bunch of operators, like this thing? 
The ambiguity associated to inequivalent orderings can quickly turn into a huge nightmare. You had better have an organizational strategy for these kinds of computations. In the language of SL2F, we want to keep track of the constant terms that arise when sigma m and sigma of minus m appear next to each other in the products of formal sums. In other words, normal ordering is a notational convention that affords just that. We'll circle back to this discussion as it applies to Wick's theorem in quantum field theory after we define normal ordering for operator algebras. Originally, we solved the issue of ordering ambiguities by defining the formal series of operators E plus and E minus, and together use them to define the twisted vertex operator X of sigma and Z. And this is a pretty complicated place to start. Despite the potentially confusing sign conventions, note that this construction places all of the negative powers of Z, and therefore positive values of T, to the right, and all the positive powers of Z to the left. And that is the primary objective of normal ordering. To be more precise, we define the normal ordered product of operators, denoted by pairs of dots, to be the product of operators ordered by increasing values of their degree. To be crystal clear, the normal ordered product of two operators, alpha of r and alpha of s, is given by alpha r alpha s if r is less than s, and alpha s alpha r if r is greater than s. Notice that the ordering is irrelevant if r equals s. Given our ultimate desire to simply separate operators of positive and negative degree, this sort of partial ordering of operators might seem excessive, but it's a fairly simple and intuitive convention, which is why we employ it. As FLM points out, the operators inside the dots have no a priori ordering. They're just a set of operators under consideration. The normal ordering convention is what gives the product their meaning as an operator. We have in mind here the troubles that stem from issues around some ability and existence, etc., which of course is the whole point of having a normal ordering convention. Okay, definitions aside, let's do some examples. Example one, the Vita Soto generators. You might recall the Vita Soto algebra that we studied in lectures 21 through 23. In that case, we define the series of pairwise products of operators H which for L of n was given by, and for L of zero, we had this kind of awkward convention with absolute value signs. This was of course to keep these operators of negative degree to the left and the operators with positive degree to the right, but it's not hard to see that normal ordering resolves this ambiguity, allowing us to write a single expression for both kinds of operators, at the slight expense of explicitly including the central term with the Kronecker delta symbol. To try your hand at this technology, you might evaluate the normally ordered k-fold product of sigma z in terms of sigma z plus and sigma z minus. Remember, operators in sigma z plus have positive degree, but multiply negative powers of the formal variable z. Okay, for another example, we can rebuild the twisted vertex operator x using normal ordering. To that end, first recall the so-called degree derivation of the formal series big D given by z d by dz. d has a well-defined inverse on the space of formal sums of the endomorphisms of our usual Heisenberg module h over z without the z zero term. Since sigma has only half integral powers of z, the action of d inverse on alpha z is well-defined, and is given by what amounts to the antiderivative which hopefully gives you a familiar expression. Thus, those crazy operators E plus or minus can be expressed in terms of D inverse acting on alpha plus or minus. And therefore, it's straightforward to see that the twisted vertex operator X of alpha Z can be expressed in terms of the normal ordered formal exponential. Which is nice and clean. Also, we note that we could write it this way because sigma is odd under the involution, which means that d inverse is well defined on sigma, which is why we deal with twisted vertex operators, rather than the untwisted case, or the twisted case where sigma is even, first. 
As another example, we can consider the normal ordered product of vertex operators, for which our laborious proof of their algebraic relationships in terms of alpha and beta last time now seems trivial. Fun! Okay, if the utility of normal ordering wasn't enough of a motivation for you, then hopefully this quick sketch of Giancarlo Wick's famous theorem from quantum field theory might be up your alley. In physics, particles like electrons and photons are represented by quantum fields, which are essentially formal series of operators, where the formal variables are slightly more complicated. Their solutions to a second-order differential equation, usually a wave equation of some kind, that are subject to boundary conditions. The operators A and A dagger, however, are familiar and belong to a Heisenberg algebra just like the ones we've been working with. The main relationship there is given by the commutator, or Lie bracket, of AM with A dagger N, which amounts to a delta function. This is just a slight reworking of the algebraic notation that we've been using. To make contact with what we've been doing, Simply identify a n with sigma of n, where n is strictly positive. A dagger can then be identified with negative values of n. Purists in the audience might scream about m being an integer or a half integer or whatever, but we can ignore that subtlety for now. As mentioned, the operators a and a dagger belong to a Heisenberg algebra, whose module can be represented by polynomials in the a dagger operators which act on some suitably defined vacuum vector, which of course is also annihilated by all of the A's, as per usual. A typical thing that physicists want to measure can be reduced to a computation of some inner product in the module with a few operators presented. Here, the operator T represents time ordering on the formal series of fields phi, which ensures that the physical objects we're considering make sense you can think of time ordering as a means of keeping the products of operators consistent with the boundary conditions satisfied by the wave functions that represent our formal variables. Okay, Wick's theorem tells us how to compute time ordered products of operators in terms of normally ordered products of operators. More precisely, these observables are given by the normal ordered product of all the fields together with all possible combinations of their commutators. It's a combinatorial problem, really. Nothing too serious. But to contextualize it, note that each field phi will have an A and an A dagger, appearing in equal numbers. And because of this, all normally ordered products will end in an A, and therefore annihilate the vacuum. Thus, the only terms that are non-vanishing are those strictly proportional to the commutators of operators. And now here's the kind of amazing bit. The inner product of the vacuum vector with the commutator of two fields, say phi of z and phi of w, acting on the vacuum, is precisely the Green's function that encodes the physically relevant boundary conditions for the quantum field wave functions. Those things we use as formal variables in the formal series phi of z. Thus, the general time ordered product of operators gives us quantities that are proportional to the combinations of various Green's functions, which, of course, generate our physical solutions. Crazy, right? Okay, yeah, that was fast and that was just a sketch and it's by no means a complete lecture on Wick's theorem, but hopefully it motivated for you the various features and the importance of the normally ordered product. And that's our show. Next time, we'll finish off our construction of the affine Lie algebra SL2F modules using twisted vertex operators. Mm -hmm.